Hello, everyone. My name is Ken Blackburn. I'm the executive director of the Campbell River Arts Council, and I'm the program manager for the museum at Campbell River. And today we'll be talking with Iko Jones and Kim Isles about their film, Salmon Capital, Campbell River. The film will be launched, in a sense, for the Art and Earth Festival that will take place from September 25th to 27th, uh, coming up. So let's talk with Iko and Kim. Uh, first of all, we'll go with to you, Eiko, and uh, maybe just take us back to the roots of, of the project and kind of the beginnings of the film and where it all started. For sure. Thanks, Ken. Uh, so we were looking about a year and a half ago or early last year, looking for some different film projects to take on as a project. And we heard about the Story Hive uh, documentary grant, which is a program run through TELUS which basically gives funding to groups of people to do documentaries. And so the, we looked it up and that current year, which is last year, their uh, mandate was for a locally reflective story from the town that you live in. And seeing as I've been photographing salmon and filming salmon and was working on a different film with salmon and Cameron River is a salmon capital world, we thought, hmm, it could be a good way to, to make a story that's highlighting Campbell River and the fact that you know we're known as the salmon capital of the world so we basically did some uh, digging and thought you know conceptualizing and basically came up with an idea for a story that basically shows how salmon has shaped the identity of Canberra and led to the to its crowning as the camp as the salmon capital of the world and everything that that entails going back from first nations to time history to the current and the future and so we started putting together a proposal um, Put it out to you know launch it on the story hive uh, platform and with great community support there was public voting and different things we got funded and uh were able to start get the go ahead on the film yeah okay and just staying with you for a second i call you know i know that you have been working for some time with underwater photography uh and have you know gone from still photography into filmmaking for this particular project uh were you using a, a lot of footage that you had previously taken or did you kind of start from scratch with it most of it was from scratch i used a little bit of stock footage of some of the underwater shots of salmon that i've shot that last year but most of it was shot specifically for this film okay great yeah okay and then over to you kim maybe you can just take us through some of the the mechanics of the production or some of the you know things that you've set up and how you structured it and basically how you made the film happen can you want to just address that yeah sure thanks ken um it was really an interesting process for us because um immediately we knew of several people that we would want to interview so how we did it is we interviewed several people or companies that were um, um, intricately tied with the salmon industry and the more we talked to people the more we found out that there were people that we needed to talk to so it was a really interesting process trying to narrow down um, but as it turned out we ended up interviewing well more but what showed up in the film were about 12 people in various industry or well, connected to the salmon industry, but in various um, uh, environments, if you will. Um, and it ranged from First Nations cultural, um, cultural component to molecular biology and lab work um, to uh, you name it, um, all kinds of different areas. And, and it, it probably didn't even begin to touch, but I think it gives a flavor for how tied this community is uh, to the salmon industry and how it truly has shaped the, the, the history of this town. So we went about interviewing people. It was wonderful. We got to meet a lot of people, some people we knew already, um, and uh, we met a lot of interesting characters along the way. Um, opposing views sometimes, which was really an interesting process as well, but also necessary to the, to the narrative. Um, and so then I, um, my role was as host, um, interviewing the people. Iko was behind the camera um, and also directing. Um, so uh, we brought together a, a cohesive story, starting with First Nations involvement with salmon um, upwards of 9,000 years ago and how that has played out to not only the present moment, but also moving into the future. What 
uh, Campbell River is doing to ensure that you know salmon stocks stay healthy and um, that there's a, um, a healthy future for the town in this area as well. So we went about interviewing people and, and um, put it all together in, in a bit of a historical perspective. It was really interesting. Wow, very ambitious project because this, the history of salmon is indeed long and deep in this community and, and sometimes contentious. I, I'm sure you get different opinions on things. So what, you know, what kind of challenges came up uh, along the way? or during the making of the film, but I'm sure some would also be in post-production too with the editing of the film. Well, and one of the interesting things that came up for us, and, and it wasn't a, a huge challenge, but it was something that we had to acknowledge is that in, this in the industry, it can be quite contentious. Um, there are opposing views and we had to sit with that and we had to um, reconcile our, our own opinions, perhaps our, our own thoughts around where the salmon industry was heading with the, the story. And the story was broader than our opinions. And so we were reporting on, on the history. So um, sports fishing is huge in this community, um, but it's way more than sports fishing. And so there were lots of different opinions around um, the state of, of salmon and why that is. And we needed to actually include all of it. Aquaculture was huge. You know, you may, you may like aquaculture, you may disagree with aquaculture, but it is intricately tied with the story of salmon and Campbell River. And so it would have been remiss of us to have not included that. So it, it was really a fascinating look. And we, we had to just kind of keep our opinions to the side and tell a story and tell the whole story, which is what we endeavored to do. Um, Post-production was interesting. Um, that actually happened in New Zealand. <laughs> so that was largely, that largely fell on Iko's hands because he's the, he's the computer whiz. Um, I have a background also in that area, but certainly not as it relates to um, photography and film work. And that's an area of specialty for him. So we were in New Zealand visiting family. As you know, we saw you there, Ken. Um, and ended up being stranded there for several months. So that was post-production. Who gets to do post-production in New Zealand, right? Lucky us. So, <laughs> so it was put to good use. When we went into lockdown, um, it was work time. So yeah, interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, well, I can't, yeah. having seen where you were in New Zealand, I can't think of a better place to be locked down for post-production. So, so okay, let's just continue with that. Back to you, Iko, then, in terms of post-production and, uh, you know, the, when you're, you know, taking footage, generally you end up with three, four, five, six times as much footage as you need. And where were the challenges in trying to determine, A, how long was this film going to be and who, you know, what do you cut and what do you keep in? Do you want to talk a little yeah, bit? Yeah, that, that definitely was a challenge. Um, what we ended up doing is we taught, we identified you know, 12, 15 people that we wanted to talk to that covered sort of a wide spectrum. Then we, we, we came up with a list of questions for them. But what we did is we based each person's um, emphasis on a certain uh, theme. So for example, one of the persons, the theme was uh, the economic development of Canberra. Another person's might've been um, recreation or, or some cultural aspects. And so we left, we, we didn't ask, each person the same questions. We kind of had fo a focus for each of the interviewees. So that we, we asked all those questions and then we basically took the transcripts of you know, the answers and got the, the key points that we wanted to have shown and that came across good. And we narrowed it down to those things and then basically created an edit from that to tell the story. And then, you know, just kept winnowing away and cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting and eventually end up, you know, the, the first, rough cut was about 35 minutes long and then we had to get it down to less than 25 minutes so there was a lot of cutting involved and removing entire sections that we were quite attached to but yeah. didn't you know we, we really liked certain parts we did like for example we went to Port Alberni to try to instigate some uh, friendly competition we filmed you know a pretty fun sequence over there but working with the mentors that we had with Talos and things so we just decided to cut that section out because it didn't 
necessarily add to the story in a way that was needed and it just took time and so we we did a lot of so you know hard looking at it and repeated cuts to get to where it is today for sure were some of the guidelines for tell us in story hive was there a prescribed length that it had to come under was that what was determining you know, the the kind of editing you were making no it, it had to be between 20 minutes and 60 minutes mm -hmm. but we initially put it out there that it was going to be about 35 minutes long and then as we're going um and talking with our mentors that we had and the, the national screen institute people that we were talking with we basically came up with a kind of a 25 minute is a perfect time length for this type of thing so you know partway through the production we kind of gave that as a goal of the timeline that we worked towards okay cool and then kim just back to you briefly what in once the film is done then what happens i mean does tell us basically take uh, or manage the release of it or were you uh, you know somewhat on your own to find find uh, like venues or festivals or avenues to show the film in well there were original um, guidelines and due to covid they have shifted somewhat um so yeah they have um first right of release and that was to have happened right about now actually was the original plan um due to covid and some production issues that happened when people were in lockdown and what have you, they decided to um, postpone the release um, on Optic TV and what have you. But um, what was agreed was that they would release it online. So we know everything has shifted somewhat. So we're just going to go with the flow here. So the, the film and all the other documentary filmmakers, their films as well, they'll all, all be released online. And then the uh, release on the Optic TV platform will be at some point next year. Okay. Yeah. So everything has shifted. That yeah. For sure, uh, including you know the Art and Earth Festival here in Campbell River, uh, which is basically all online uh, again. Yeah. So, so we will be we will be kind of releasing the link for the film, as I say, on September twenty fifth. Um, and this this interview will be the preamble to the release of that link uh, for the Art Nerd Festival. Just before we wrap up, uh, either of you, have we missed anything or anything you want to say before? Just, the, just thanking the community. I'd like to thank the community for the support. So, so maybe just ask that question and answer. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, and just, I, I'd like to add too, though, Ken, that yeah, although the the bulk of the funding came from Telus through the Story Hive platform. Like Eiko mentioned at the beginning that um, we wouldn't have even received that had it not been for tremendous community support from, from Campbell River residents. So super appreciative. And then we also had some financial support independent of Story Hive from the Campbell River area and Campbell River, Campbell River um, City. So deeply yeah. appreciative of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the city of Campbell really, the city of Campbell River really stepped up the economic development. Um, had a part of it and uh, the local radio station today FM I mean the promotion that we got with the with the voting for to get the funding mm -hmm. uh, it was just the, the community support the, the way people rallied behind the project and it was always a story about Cam River not about salmon so we really felt like we got a good um, support from the community rallying around this town and our hope is that this film just helps make people proud to be from Canberra River and call themselves the Canberra River, right? Because it's showing a part of Canberra River that's deep history and it's not the only part of Canberra River, but it's a significant part and we hope that it just makes people proud to be from Canberra River. Excellent. Yeah, well said. Um, one thing you learn living living here is just how how proud people are of the community, how they do pull together very well. Uh, the, the salmon is, is uh, absolutely integrated into the history, but this is truly an amazing town that will get behind things and support them. So, yeah, okay, thank you very much for your time today. Um, Aiko, Kim, the, as I say, this will be released uh, before, we, um, before we release the link for the, the film. Um, Salmon Capital, Campbell River. I keep getting confused because, uh, as an aside, there is also at the end of the festival, Ico um, will be delivering the annual Hague Brown lecture for his other film, The Heart 
uh, heartbeat of the river um, that will be the focus of the Hague Brown lecture this year. So in a sense, uh, you two will bookend the festival. You're going to both open it and close it. So thanks for your time Sounds today, good. Michael. Thanks for your time today, Kim. And we'll, My we'll pleasure. Just, um, thanks, we'll just, Ken. You're welcome. Yeah, we'll close mm -hmm. up with that. Perfect.